Good morning, good morning. Yeah. If you're in the hallway, I'd like to ask you to come into the sanctuary. If you're joining us online, welcome. I'm going to pray and we're going to jump right into worship this morning. Jesus, we love you. God, we honor you. We lift your name above every other. God, we thank you for your freedom. And we thank you for how you have brought us out of every situation that we've needed your help from. You are good. And we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. You sound like some folk that are free this morning. You're singing like you believe it. Like you believe it. It is so good to see all of you this morning. We welcome you. If this is your first time being with us, I hope you'll take a minute and fill out one of the visitor's card in the uh, seat in front of you. Drop it in uh, the offering bag or give it to me on the way out the door. But uh, we're just delighted you're here. It's going to be a great, great day from start to finish, and we're happy that you're here to be a part of it. A couple of things I want to mention. First of all, just to remind you that immediately following service today, we've got a luncheon prepared for you. Uh, we're excited about the, the meeting today. It's kind of a yearly meeting. We call it a quarterly meeting, but it's kind of a yearly meeting. And I want to just encourage all of you to stay and be a part of it. We have made preparations for there to be food so that we wouldn't be in a rush. We are going to be mindful of your time. It's not our intention to keep you for two and a half hours this afternoon. As a matter of fact, we got another class going at four, so I can promise you we won't be here past four. But... Uh, it, the, the idea is that today is not only about electing our leadership, our deacons going into the new year, which is an important item, and we always, always, always uh, you know, approach that prayerfully, but there's a lot of other things that we're going to be sharing with you, things that we're looking to do in the upcoming year, and there's also an opportunity for you to share with us things that are on your heart and mind. As you know, if you've been here for any length of time, we are very big on God working and moving and using every part of the body. And so our leadership has an incredibly important responsibility to lead. But that leadership, you know, comes through the Holy Spirit and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, wisdom that God gives, but also just from, from good words and encouragements and things that you share with us. So please, please, please stay and be a part of that. Raise your right hand. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> And that, that meeting will start immediately following service. And again, we will be mindful of your time. Uh, I want to remind you of our Sunday school, adult Sunday school class that goes on at 945 every Sunday morning. Encourage you to be a part of that. Look like the room was full this morning. Also encourage you about our Wednesday night service. Our meal starts at 6 o'clock. Our lesson starts at 645. And we've just been having a great study in uh, just kind of the life and ministry of Jesus. And I encourage you to come. You'll be blessed to be here. We've also got a laundromat outreach, uh, November the 18th. I know these dates are a couple of weeks away, but I wanted to just kind of make you aware of it. The in-betweeners uh, met last night here at the church and just had a great time together. Uh, their next meeting, if you want to be a part of that group, will be November the 18th. Uh, the location we will announce later, it'll be at 6 o'clock, so there's a lot going on on the 18th. Also, on the 11th of November, uh, the men's breakfast is scheduled and then I, I wanted just to kind of throw this out there. Many of you that have been around for a while know that uh, it's probably been maybe two and a half years ago, three years ago, we put together a directory in an attempt for you to be able to kind of make connections and figure out who belongs to who. Uh, we've got copies of that directory out there, but if you glance at that directory, if you picked one up, you notice that it's really a little bit dated. And so what we want to try to do beginning in November is to uh, set up a couple of Sundays immediately following service where we'll snap the pictures of those of you who aren't cur currently in our directory. As you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've had a lot of folks that have joined the church, and so we're excited to get all of you into the directory. It is a phenomenal tool not only to figure out who's who, but it's also incredibly helpful in terms of just praying one for another, just to have that directory there with pictures you know, faces and names. And so we're going to try to make that happen into November. We'll, we'll give you more dates. All that I just mentioned to you is floating around on our website and uh, we're texting things out. I will say this, that if you're not on our text out, uh, I hope that you will uh, see Carolyn or somebody that can get you plugged in and connected. It's very easy to get on the list and that's the way we communicate things. Also prayer requests. Uh, which leads me into this morning's special prayer request. I know that we've had uh, many in our church family that have been sick and kind of under the weather that we're praying for. We want to continue to remember Jeff Malarski. I know we had special prayer for him last week, and we want to continue to hold him and his family up. Also, I found out yesterday evening that Seal, sweet Seal, uh, had a heart attack, and they did uh, put in three stints yesterday uh, afternoon, sometime yesterday. And so she's going to doing well. I think uh, Cheryl actually talked to her on the phone yesterday afternoon. And so she is going to be in the hospital for a couple of days. Cheryl, do you want to add to that? Okay. Okay. 
absolutely. Remember her and Rachel both, and uh, she is a tough, tough lady. And any of you that have spent more than about 30 seconds with her, she is a jewel. You will not have to guess what is on her mind. I promise you, you will not have to guess what is on her mind. She will tell you. But there's nobody I'd rather have praying for me and loving on me than her. And uh, so let's just hold her up in prayer. I also wanted to mention a final uh, prayer request. Uh, Erin, a niece of uh, Ed and Carolyn, uh, she, she is in Texas, and they're going to be leaving on Thursday to travel out there to not only see Erin and her family, but also to see other family members. And we're going to be praying for Ed and Carolyn as they travel. But Erin, uh, for the last three and a half years, has been battling cancer, and things have gotten really, really bad. I know Carolyn mentioned to me that, that literally Aaron has been kind of taking some form of chemo and different things for the last three years, three and a half years. So uh, they're going out there just to see her, to encourage, to pray, to love on them. And I know that uh, Aaron would certainly appreciate We know that God is able, don't we? I mean, we know that. Man, we are seeing the, the hand of God working and moving. So we certainly this morning are praying an audacious prayer. God can, can speak life and healing over her body but also that God will bring comfort and strength to her family just during this season. That's a long time to be battling. And so we're holding up Aaron this morning. Uh, also just continue to remember those that were devastated in Maine, of course. I know you've been paying attention to the news and certainly all that has been going on in Israel. Um, I know that there are a lot of other needs. That's just the tip of the iceberg, but we serve a mighty big God, don't we? A mighty big God. And so this morning, He knows every need. Before the ushers take up the tithe and offering, I want us just to go to the Lord in prayer. This literally is not just a formality we go through. We do this every week, but it's not literally something we do just so we can go to the next stage. This is you and I as the people of God calling upon our Father, saying, Lord, we trust you. You're our source. You're our help and strength. And the things that are the biggest and most difficult, and even those things that may seem tiny and small sometimes, Lord, we're putting those in your hands and we're trusting you. And that trust is well-placed when you put it in Christ. Father, today I thank you and praise you for your goodness and mercy, your love over us. And this morning, there is already the witness of your Spirit in this place, your Spirit testifying to our Spirit that we are your sons and daughters. And so, Lord, I thank you. When there is turmoil around the world, you are the God of all comfort and peace. God, when there are tragedies that are happening on every hand, you are able to come alongside in entire communities and countries and bring strength and encouragement. And God, you do that in so many different ways, but, but you also do it through the hands of those who represent you. And so, Lord, I pray for all who are laboring and loving and giving and working and serving, that you would hold them up, Lord, and let them be strategic and let them be empowered and anointed by you, God, to speak life where there's death, to speak hope where there seems to be no hope. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would move. We hold up Aaron this morning and Jeff and his family. We hold up Seal this morning, God. And God, these needs and so many others are so, so important to us, but they're important to you. And God, you're standing right in the middle of these things with them. And so, Lord, we're asking the audacious thing. Lord, because we know that you're more than able, that you would bring healing and restoration to each of their bodies. Lord, that you would do what you bore stripes on your body to, to accomplish and make available to us that by your stripes we can be healed and we are healed. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you would work on behalf of these. I pray that you would bring comfort and strength God, I pray specifically this morning for Miss Seal as she's in that hospital room that she will know that she is loved and missed. And Father, that she will know you are right there in the middle of this thing with her. And God, we just praise you and thank you for all that you are doing and those things you are going to do in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. As the ushers receive the tithe and offering, I'm going to ask uh, Elvira if she would come up and she had asked if, if she could share something with you this morning and so I want her to come do that as uh, you guys receive the, the offering. Father's love letter, an intimate message from you, from God to you, my child. You may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the hairs on your head are numbered. For you were made in my image. In me, you lived, 
more and have your being. You are my offspring. I, I knew you even before you were conceived. I choose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake, for all your ways are written in my book. I determine the exact time of your birth, where you would live. You are fe fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together when you were in your mother's womb and brought you forth in the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am a, I'm not a distant and angry God, but I am an expression of, of my love for you. It is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider. I meet all your needs. My plan for your future always is filled with hope. Because I love you, an everlasting love, my thoughts towards you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good for you. You are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and with all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. Delight in me, I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is who, I who gave you those desires. I'm able to do more than you could possibly imagine. For I'm great. I'm your great encourager. I'm also the father who comforts you in your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I'm close to you. As the shepherd carries the lamb, I carry you close to, to my heart. One day I will wipe your, your, all your tears away from your eyes, and I will take all the pain you suffered on this earth. I am your father. I love you, even as I love my son Jesus. My love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am what I am for you, not against you, but against for you to tell you that I'm counting your sins that I'm not counting your sins Jesus died on, on the cross so we could be reconciled his death his I'm sorry okay his death was ultimate expression of my love for you I gave you everything I I gave up everything I love that you may gain love if you receive my gift of the, my son Jesus, you receive me. Nothing will ever separate my love from you again. Come home, and I'll throw but the biggest party in heaven has ever seen. I've always been father, and I'll always be father. My question is, will you my, will you my child? Will you be my child? I am waiting for you. Love your dad, the almighty God. Micah 7, 7 states, Therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. This next song we're about to do is a declaration that God, we're asking your spirit just to fall all over us. Many times we feel that God is not with us when the truth of the matter is we're not with God. God is always with us. So we are declaring today, Lord, we just let your spirit fall on us. Well, I've come into this place, feel the presence of the Lord. 
when I feel discouraged, when I keep on when I'm tired and I'm weary, Jesus comforts me when I am alone. When I doesn't seem spirit fall. Fall all over me, spirit fall. Oh, come and set me free. You're my healer, my comforter. You are the one of mine. Lord, each night so sweet. There's been times in life I've questioned if I'm worthy of your love. And I'm reminded without your heavenly spirit, I will never be alone. And it's through your grace and mercy, on that holy rock I stand. And I will lift my voice. Just want to speak Jesus to every heart and mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. So I speak Jesus. I need your presence. I just want to speak. Jesus. 
Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name. Just wanna speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus.
thought just keeps coming to my mind that there are those this morning, we had prayer just a moment ago for Jim and Julie's uh, neighbor that we texted out a couple of days ago, just the, the tragedy that's happened in their life and the, the need of God's grace and comfort and strength. But the thought just keeps coming to my mind this morning that there are folk in this room this morning that you are weary and heavy laden. You are anxious and nervous and weary and tired. And I want to just open this altar. It's always open anyway. But I want to just say to you as they sing that chorus again, this is an anthem and a declaration of what we believe, that God is mighty and powerful and able to move and that He will in this very moment lift anxieties and worries and fears and the terror that comes by night sometimes that He can lift that off of you. So as they play this and sing this one more time, if you're here this morning and specifically you're battling with anxiety and worry, or maybe you're just heavy laden this morning and you're just tired, you're just having to really work to put one foot in front of the other, I want you to come and just either stand or kneel across this front and as a church body, we want to pray for you this morning. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus.
church something like it. The thought just keeps coming to my mind that we've spent a few moments in here in a sense of travail. Travail is when everything in you is poured out before the Lord. But the thing that kept coming to my mind was the song of Miriam, the, the, the sister of Moses, where she declared the horse and the rider of Egypt, they've been washed away. And I could, that thought just kept going through my mind this morning that as we responded in obedience to Him, as we declared this morning liberty and freedom over our lives that is given by Him, literally the horse and the riders, those, what were they, what were they to, to Moses and Miriam and all of the children of Israel as they came out? It was the thing that was hunting them down. It was the thing that was after them, that was on their heels. And my declaration this morning is that as you've said yes, we can now move into the mode of celebrating that the thing that was dogging our, on our heels is gone. That you're free. He whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Is free indeed. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And it behooves us to sing the song. Here's the thing about it. It ain't got to be the song she sang, but it's the same kind of song. It's the song of liberation and freedom and healing and restoration. So I want us to do this. Whatever you got cooked up there, we're going to sing it with a different attitude, with a different heart. We're singing it not as those who are just looking forward to deliverance, but those that have just received deliverance, who have just been set free who are going to walk out of this place and the anxieties and fears and worries that have dogged us don't have our number anymore. They're not, they're not going to overtake us. The purpose of God is not going to be sidetracked because of them. They've got no place to root and stay planted. So we're a free people this morning as we sing this song. Let's sing it one more time. Let's sing it. Your name is power. Your name Thank you, Lord, for the strength, not just to make it one. 
goes hand in hand with what we were talking about Wednesday night where Jesus takes the disciples and they travel to Caesarea Philippi and he takes them to a place where there's all these other gods and 
other worship, worshiping other things, and he looks at his disciples and said, Who do you say that I am? Peter declares, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You understand? That's what this is for us. It's a moment where you declare where your help comes from. It's a, it's a moment where you're declaring who it is you're going to follow. Scott was telling me of an, a, a, an illustration that a pastor did where he literally took one leg on one ladder and another one on another ladder that were going in two different directions because there comes a point where you have to decide which ladder you're going to get on. And I'm going to tell you this morning what you did was you climbed on the side of Jesus when you declared this morning from this altar and with your mouth that you're going to follow. Remember Jesus at one point looks at his disciples and he said, will you also turn away like the many others? Peter looks at him and says, where could we go? Where would we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. And this morning you chose, and I believe you knew you were choosing, and you chose him. You chose peace. You chose comfort, strength. But you also chose to follow Him wherever that takes you. And that, my friends, that's the adventure. To know that wherever it is He takes you, He's going to walk right along beside you. Amen, 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 amen. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. I don't know how to transition from that or even if there is a transition from that. That's good stuff. Good stuff that doesn't stop. There is not a stop. Understand, I am not putting a punctuation mark at the end. Even though if I did, it would be six exclamation marks that I would put right here. I'm going to go ahead uh, and dismiss the children if you want to. I I'm going to be fairly brief this morning, but there is a word that I want to declare over this group of people, and I cannot, I, I shouldn't be surprised, but this morning, watching what God has done this morning and the way that He is moving and working, and then thinking about the word that I, that, that I came in this morning to bring to you, it is beautiful to see how God just kind of brings it together. And this is really a sermon, yes, you know, words that I'm going to speak, yes, but it, it's more a declaration and an anthem. And even more so, it's what we've seen lived out this morning in this altar. Now, you can't see it from where you're at, but I'm looking and literally I'm seeing tears that are on the altar. Now, I get, and the beautiful thing and the amazing thing is that an altar can be anywhere, right? I realize these are steps that get you from the ground to the stage without having to jump when you're old like me. But how beautiful is it that when we kneel before God, every space and place we are becomes an altar. Your bed side becomes an altar. That log that you walk to back in the woods, it becomes an altar. And these steps literally as a hallowed space and place set apart for God become a place. They become an altar unto the Lord. And this morning as a pastor to look across this altar and see tears, not metaphorical tears, but literal tears. Tears that are like wet on the altar. I can't help, and, and, and when I say to you, well done, it's not a, a, a phrase of condensation. You know, like I'm, I'm looking down and saying, oh, good job, you finally got it right. I'm saying, congratulations, this is what the people of God are intended to do. To run to God, to cry before Him, to lay their burdens down and watch the way that He can transform and work in their lives. It goes hand in hand with Mark chapter 2 this morning that I want to read from. I want to talk to you about pulling back the roof. Literally, what is it that's keeping you away from Jesus? Now, this, this story is given in three of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three, record this miracle by Jesus. Remember for the last, this is week five, we've been talking about the miracles of Jesus. And I want to read the text to you, and then I want to make just a few comments. But it isn't a de declaration. Don't, don't forget this. It is a declaration of what we've just seen happen. Because what's happened this morning is some of you pulled back the roof for some friends that needed an encounter with Jesus. I, I can't tell you as a pastor how excited I get when all of a sudden I see folk coming up to this altar or asking to be anointed and without me even having to open my mouth and say a word, I see some of you running to the battle. If you want to know what makes a pastor's heart glow, it's not words necessarily that people say, it's when your action backs up what you say. It's, it's where the rubber meets the road. The proof, as they used to say, is in the pudding. And when I see you run into this altar and laying your hands one for another, this passage of Scripture comes to my mind because as you know, this is a passage about four friends who were so concerned about a friend that they were willing to forego all cultural and societal norms. They were willing to stand out. 
They were willing to go against the grain. They were willing to swim upstream because they believed that Jesus could do something about their situation. And that's exactly what I saw in this altar this morning is folk running to the battle, praying one for another, weeping with those that were weeping and that had gone through heaviness and sadness and sorrow, but also because we weep together, we get to rejoice together, the Scripture says. And there's that second piece where we begin to sing, and I mentioned to you the song of Miriam, that the horse and the riders of Egypt that have dogged us and pursued us, they've been swept away by the power of God. Listen, I don't want you to leave this place this morning paranoid about the thing that God removed from you this morning as though it's going to sneak back up. You understand, there's plenty of anxiety. When Jesus said, you know, there's enough evil of the day to take care of itself, you don't have to make it up. You don't have to worry about it. There's always going to be a new challenge. But understand, some of you today need to hear me say, don't leave this place paranoid and looking out your rearview mirror to see the anxieties and worries that were lifted off of you today coming back because they're off your heels. You understand the liberty and the freedom He gave you today is absolute and complete from that. Now again, there's going to be some stuff. My wife says all of life is lived in front of you. We're not living looking through the rear view mirrors or the side mirrors to see what's happening back there. We're in a moment where we're saying, God, right now, I say yes to you. I, I lay down the pains and the sadnesses and the sorrows. I lay down the failures and mistakes I've made, but I'm going to pursue you. And to follow you means you're leading, you're guiding, and I'm going to follow you. My Lord, Mark chapter 2 verse 1 says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that Jesus was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. I love that little detail there. They not only had packed every square inch of this fairly small house, they were standing in the doorway. The reason that's important is because the man who is being brought by the four friends, their intention is to get him into the physical presence of Jesus. And the writer wants us to understand that even the doorways were clogged. Even the doorways had people standing in line, well-intentioned, trying to get to Jesus. The beautiful thing is that many of folk will say, well, God ain't got time to hear me right now. He's got a whole lot of other stuff He's taking care of. I can't think of anything more theologically opposed to what we believe about God, can you? And yet we buy that all the time. I'm not going to ask Him for me because He's got a lot of other things that He's got on His mind and other needs and requests. And we say it this way, there are people that have it much worse than I do. Well, understand, I recognize there are people that have it worse than I do, but it doesn't take away from the fact that He cares about each of us. And when the door is clogged, there's sometimes you're going to climb up on the roof not because somehow you're the last one, but simply because you refuse to not be denied a hearing with Jesus. The great thing is you can be like Bartimaeus in the back row and shout it out. Immediately many gathered together so there was no longer room to receive them. Verse 2, not even near the door. And Jesus preached the word to them. Then they came to Him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near Him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where He was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in His spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, He said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? You ever had that happen where you don't say something out loud and we have the misbegotten notion because we don't say it out loud, God doesn't hear it? <laughs> Jesus is, we say it this way, Jesus is reading their mail. He understands the skepticism they have and even though we don't have record that they're saying it out loud because how many of you know that some people will say things that they won't say directly to the person? Some people will even say things they won't say things to God, you know, but they'll think it in their mind. And Jesus just cuts to the chase and says, I know what you're thinking. God knows what you're thinking. Why do you reason about these things in your heart? Verse 9, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and take up your bed and walk. 
But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise and take up your bed and go to your house. Now a cool thing happens here. The attention of Jesus momentarily from the friends to the paralytic, his attention is now moved to those religious leaders, the skeptics, those scribes, those pharisaical spirited people that we talked about last week. And he's looked at them, but now Jesus' attention is back on the man who's been lowered through the roof. And when he looks at him and says, you have without even meaning to become a point of contention to a whole lot of people. There's a whole lot of eyes that are on you and maybe this is even a guy who doesn't like a whole lot of attention drawn to himself. Nonetheless, you are right in the middle of this thing. He looks at him and he says to him, Arise and take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately, verse 12 says, Immediately he took up the bed and he went out in the, to the, in the presence of them all. And they all were amazed and glorified God saying, We never saw anything like this. We never saw anything like this. That'd be a good sermon title. We never saw anything like this. The beautiful thing is, no matter how you could say, I've never seen anything like this, God has a way of always topping it, doesn't He? I, I've spent the last 38 plus years of my life saying to myself, I could have never thought that way. I could have never done that. I could have never imagined that. And God, it can't get any better. And then the very next breath, it gets better. It's not that there's not hardship and there's not difficulty, but as you walk with Him and you, you listen to Him and you watch Him work and move, you continually realize that God's ability for and His intentions toward people are greater than you could imagine. At every moment, He is working on so many layers and levels. I think it's the reason that Jesus said there are times in your life where you're simply going to have to say, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Let what you've got going on in your mind and what you're speaking and saying and doing, let it happen in these situations. But when that happens, some people's timetables are going to get messed up. When that happens, some people are going to go through seasons of weariness and anxiety and worry because they're waiting on the fulfillment of the promise. They're waiting on the answered prayer. But God's already working and doing long before you recognize it. I want you to look at this passage of Scripture. We said last week that a religious spirit, a pharisaical spirit, has some, some things, kind of signs, characteristics. And I, I don't want to re-preach the sermon, but I want to remind you, and the reason it's important for this sermon today is because the pharisaical religious spirit is at work here. Remember last week we said that the Pharisees were more interested in the letter of the law being fulfilled than they were about a man whose hand was withered being made whole. The pharisaical spirit says stay in line, stay in your box, follow directions. But the God of heaven and earth will not be contained in a box. Even when he allowed and orchestrated and said there's going to be a place that I'm going to meet with you from above the mercy seat. I'm talking about the tabernacle and the holy of holies and then in the temple. There was a sense in which even though God said for a time and a season and a place, I'm going to meet you there at certain moments and the high priest is going to come in. Everything God laid out, it was with the understanding that there will come a day and there will come a time where I will meet with you anywhere at any time of the place of my choosing. And that's a powerful thing, guys. We're living in a time where the Spirit of the Lord rests upon us. It works in us. It dwells in us. It flows out of us. That's a powerful thing. The pharisaical spirit says this. Sometimes it makes a person emotionally stiff and rigid. We said if you're argumentative and you're always just trying to win the fight, if you're making judgments based on outward appearance, if you're fine with religious activity that doesn't really yield heart connection, we said that a condemning and judgmental spirit is a sign of a pharisaical spirit. Or being stuck in the past and closed to change. Being misdirected, zeal that, that desires to tear down. It's what Paul said had operated in, in his life. He zealously persecuted the church and thought he was pleasing God only later to recognize that he was fighting against the God he thought he was serving. Stubbornness and pride. We said when you push for perfection, uh, religion and people, you, you, you demand perfection in other people but refuse to recognize the need in your own life. Those are some of the symptoms and signs that you may be either confronting a religious spirit or you may be operating under a religious spirit. 
And listen, if you remember last week, and let me just say it again as a disclaimer, I'm not trying to point a finger and say that you are operating under a religious spirit necessarily, but you do have to ask yourself, are those attitudes and mindsets functioning and working in my life? And if so, I need to close the back door. I need to close the side windows. I need to make sure that I have the mind of Christ and the attitude of Christ. People who have a religious spirit feel justified in the way they are. They feel like they're doing the work of God. Look at the Pharisees. Look at the religious leaders of Jesus' day. When we arrive at Mark chapter 2, there's some things I want to point out to you, okay? And they're very basic, okay? I, I definitely this morning have my Captain Obvious cape on. I'm not expecting to blow your theological circuits. I'm just simply going to say out loud what we see in this passage and I think what we just sort of witness among us for the last 30 minutes. The very first point I would make about Mark chapter 2 is that when Jesus is in the house, the house is packed. When there is the authentic presence of Jesus and there is the presence of His Word, He is the Word, His spoken Word, when there is true worship that comes from the heart of His people, there will be the accompanying power of the Holy Spirit that goes right alongside that. And what I want to say to you is not that it is formulaic A plus B equals C, but I want to say to you there are some common denominators. There are some things that when they're at work in the body, you're going to see the fireworks of heaven take place. You understand that? It's not if we do this this time and we do that that time, then we're always going to get this. I love that God uniquely works in our midst, that it looks different every time. I hear you say this all the time, and I agree with it. We feel the presence of God and we see the Spirit moving every time we come together. And yet from our perspective, it looks different. From our perspective, it's unique. I say this all the time. It's just kind of a funny thing that maybe sticks in your head. It's like mama's chocolate cake, grandma's chocolate cake. It's always good. I don't know how she makes it. I don't know how she does it, but it's always tasty. And that's the way the work of the Spirit in our midst is. When there is an authentic presence of Jesus, the house is going to be packed. But here's something that Luke brings out in this story. Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. He says that the Pharisees and teachers of the law from everywhere have come to the house and they're listening to Jesus preach. Now, that's important. It means that Jesus is speaking the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the things that are on the Father's mind. He's healing the sick. He's demonstrating the power of God and yet He is inviting those who have a religious pharisaical spirit to be right in the middle of it. As a matter of fact, Luke takes it a little step further and if you go back and read Luke chapter 5, you'll see that it almost feels as though this entire retelling of this story is from the perspective of not just that four friends lowered a friend down, not just that the house was packed with people that wanted to see the power of God, but there were those Pharisees and religious folks who had the religious spirit. And this is what uh, verse 17 says, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, I'm going to tell you, up until just not that long ago, I've always read that to mean Jesus was there to heal all the sick folk. And I do believe Jesus was there to heal all the sick folk. But I want you to also step back and recognize in Luke chapter 5 that it may very well be that Jesus in that moment was looking to heal those that were of a religious spirit. He was looking to break the box, you know, the box and, and the mindset that many people in that room had. I'll come back to that. Along with preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand that Jesus did, He was willing and ready, I believe that day, to break religious spirits. He was looking to set them free. As a matter of fact, verse 26 says, And they, after the man was forgiven and then he was healed and walked away whole, they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear. And this is what they said, We have seen strange things today. I want to tell you that when God is up to stuff and when He is doing stuff, the house is not only going to be packed, but those with religious spirits and those who need an adjustment, if you will, the Spirit of God is willing to bring that to pass. He is wanting to do that. The other two gospel writers focus on other things, but it seems to me that Luke is focused in on that those with religious spirits that had rather see the letter of the law followed than people get well and whole, that spirit is the very thing Jesus wanted to challenge. Can I just prophesy and say over us that God has been and is and is going to send a whole lot of folk in this place who He sent them here to deliver them and set them free. 
Now, he could have done it in a whole lot of different places. He could have brought them to any place because he is not limited or bound. He could have done it on Highway 411. But he looked at CFC and he said, my divine plan, just like Jesus on that day when the house was packed and the religious leaders were there, my plan on this given day is that I'll do it right here in the house. And can I say to you, that gets me a little bit excited if I'm being honest with you, that the sick are going to be brought in, but they're going to walk and leave whole. That those that are bound and oppressed and weighted down with the cares of the world, God could have sent them anywhere on this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning and Wednesday night. He could have sent them anywhere He wanted to, but He sends them to CFC and He says, all I want you to do is not get full of yourself. I don't want you to think I'm a formula. I don't want you to build a box and put me in. I just want you to show up with an expectancy that if we'll say yes and obey and do what God is asking us to do, we will see the unthinkable. He walks out of that room because it was Jesus' intention not only to speak kingdom truths, but to bring the kingdom of God to bear, the power of God at work. Number two, there will always be obstacles and there will always be challenges to keep you away from Jesus. For the paralytic, it was literally the hopeless condition of not being able to walk of being dependent on other people. If you were honest today, and I wish I had time to stay here for a minute, if you were honest with yourself, many of the fears and the anxieties that grip you are not cataclysmic world-ending fears and anxieties. They're the anxieties and worries that this paralytic felt, and that is, I'm going to have to depend on somebody else. I can't take care of myself. I'm dependent on other people for things that I wish I could do on my own. I I, I think if you were honest today that a lot of us allow things to keep us. We allow obstacles and challenges to get in the way. But I want you to understand this, that from Jesus' perspective, the problems on our side look like they're a liability. I'd get to you, Jesus, if it wasn't for that. You know my anger. You know my thoughts. You know all of this other stuff. And we look at the obstacles that are in our way to get to Jesus as somehow a liability. But I think on the inside, Jesus is looking at a packed house and saying, these things that look like liabilities, these things you think are going to keep you out are the very thing when you push past them that you're going to see my mighty hand at work. What we see as a liability, Jesus sees as an opportunity. He sees as an opportunity to demonstrate His power and to set you free. Look at number three. A practical matter is this. Pick friends that help you get closer to Jesus. (laughs) one of the great things this man had done is he had put himself in a position to be loved and cared for and prayed for by four men that were not going to be held back. And I want to tell you that, listen, God can chase you, and I just said a moment ago, He'll work on you anywhere He wants to. But there is something to be said about picking the kind of fellowship and the kind of church and the kind of friends that challenge you to make you a better follower of Jesus. If you're spending more of your time around folks that drag you down and take your affections and your attention off of Jesus, can I just as a pastor and as a practical matter and as someone who would just like to see you succeed, say to you, hang around with and lock your arms with people that are challenging you to love God and trust Jesus more? See what will happen. This man chose to have four friends that weren't going to be turned away by crowds. They weren't going to be turned around by cultural nuances. They weren't going to be turned around by sorry, the house is full. They were going to get creative and they were going to think outside the box. And this is literally what verse 5 says. When Jesus saw the faith, their faith, whose faith? It wasn't the faith of the man that was being lowered down. I believe that verse 5 is referring to the faith of four men that would go so far for their friend to pull the roof back. You understand this is unestimable damage. Everything in the common thought pattern would be, I like this guy. His house is beautiful. Why would I? I cannot imagine coming to your house and intentionally clogging your toilet with toilet paper. I got your attention, didn't it? I I can't imagine coming to your house and saying, this place is beautiful. I'm going to see what I can destroy. Uh, This place is amazing. I I think I'm just going to peel some shingles off the roof. Do you understand how foreign the idea and the concept here? 
But there is something inside of the kind of friends we're talking about that will push you to the brink. If you want to know why you wake up in the middle of the night and your friend or that neighbor or that person is on your mind and you sense the Spirit say and ask the Father one more time and you obey and you talk to God about that, you understand that is right in line with the will and the per perfect will of God. Open your mouth and say that prayer. You might say, Dear God, you could have asked me to do this during daytime hours, during waking time. Everything about this scenario is to get out of the neat and tidy. It is to say it would have been great if people would have recognized the need of the paralytic was so great. Let's get out of his way and make space. You do understand that people could have come out of the house to make space for the paralytic to get in the house, right? But that isn't the way God does. How many of you have said, God, I, I want it to be neat and tidy. If you'll just do this and move that and open that and make this available to me, then I'm going to just walk back through there and I'm just going to sing, I surrender all. I surrender all. Jesus is looking at you and say, how much do you want it? Are you willing to climb on the roof? How much are you willing to, to, to put yourself out there? These four men are willing to put themselves out there. And Jesus sees the faith of the men who are lowering the paralytic down. And he says, this is the kind of faith I'm longing for and looking for. Number four, sometimes you might be disappointed with the response of Jesus. I know that sounds like a weird point to throw in here, but if you read this passage, they brought their friend to get healed, right? And Jesus looks at him and says, your sins be forgiven you. Now remember, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisaic, Pharisaical religious spirited leaders that are in the room. He's dealing with that, but in his mind he knows that not only does he have the power to forgive the sin of this man, but he also has the power and is going to heal the man, and the man's going to leave different than when he came. You've got to be willing, though, to stand in that moment and all of the disappointment is oozing over you because the thing is not happening the way you thought it would. If I rip the ceiling back, if I lower my friend down and Jesus is looking directly at him and then grant something I was not even asking for, there's going to be a part of me that's going to be... We peeled the ceiling back to get the man off the cot. We peeled the ceiling back for Jesus to show his mighty power and healing. And Jesus now is talking about theoretical stuff, sins being forgiven. But Jesus knew that he was kicking the hornet's nest. You understand that? Jesus knew he was kicking the religious hornet's nest. There's nothing he could have said in that room, virtually, that would have been more controversial to the religious, spirited, pharisaical, spirited people than I forgive your sins. Your sins are gone. That's outside the box, man. That's outside their ability to imagine or comprehend that. He sees the faith and then he grants forgiveness. And listen, what I want to say to you is, the Pharisees are hung up on the fact, does Jesus have the power to forgive sin? But the four men must have been overwhelmed with a sense of disappointment that the thing they had put their self out on the line for didn't happen. Here's the thing about it, and this is my advice to you. There's two ways you can handle disappointment. Now there's a bunch, but let me give you two quick ones. You can either deny that you were disappointed, and in that moment, act as though God does not recognize your disappointment, which is foolish, might I say. God knows your thoughts. Remember the Pharisees are sitting there thinking this stuff, and they don't recognize that Jesus is reading their mail. Listen, God knows your attitude. He knows your heart. And He knows the disappointment that you feel when you're asking Him for something, and it doesn't seem to be happening. I lowered Him down so He would be healed, and now Jesus appears to be just going to forgive His sins, and that's the end of the story, and the thing is done. You can either deny you are disappointed by that and risk offending the religious folk. Listen, if you say, I'm disappointed with God, anathema, man. There's a whole lot of places where that will get you thrown out on your head or certainly it will get you faith shamed. You know what that is? People look at you and say, well, you don't have a lot of faith, do you? You know, If you had a little more faith, God would probably do that. You'll get all kinds of stuff, but here's the thing. You can either deny you are disappointed or you can do the second thing and this is my recommendation. My recommendation is that you wait just another minute or two and see what else Jesus is up to. <laughs> Those four men, though potentially disappointed with the initial outcome, they wait around just... but They didn't grab him up and lift him. Can you see that? Them lifting him back up through in the, the roof and giving Jesus a nasty look on the way out. We didn't bring him to have his sins forgiven. We brought him so we'd never have to carry him around again. 
But they didn't run away from God. They didn't listen to me. Can I just say to you this morning that God is big enough to handle your disappointment if you are honest enough to speak that and open your heart to Him. But what you will find if you wait around just a little bit and don't sulk off and give up on God is you will see He is up to stuff that you simply cannot imagine. You've got to wait around a little longer to see what Jesus is up to because His first speech may be the forgiveness of the man's sin, but watch out because He's going to tell that guy to get up and walk out in a minute. Number four, Jesus is ready to deal with those who have a religious spirit. Jesus perceived the spirit they operated under. A religious spirit keeps people in boxes and they put God in boxes. But if you choose to follow the words of Jesus and do what He says for you to do, listen to me, all things are possible. He knows what He's up to. Here's the thing. No one gets to decide who sits at the table of Jesus. No one gets to decide who gets the miracle or not. We love to sit at our place at the table of God and say, well, they can't be there. They can't be there. Nope, 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 gone, Uh, gone, denied. But the reality is, in, in that attitude, we have lost the spirit of gratitude. You understand, we have lost our place, if you will. You and I have been invited to sit at the table of Jesus, and while seated there, we are grateful that we have been invited, and we dine, and we're impacted and influenced And there should be a sense of celebration at the work of God that is going on in the lives of the other people sitting at the table. You'd be surprised how many folks cop a pharisaical religious spirit when they look at what God is doing in other people's lives and they'll say, I know his hang-ups, I know what she said, I know what she did. And we start trying to sort of reject folks at the table. But what you don't know is what God's up to. What you don't know is what He's doing in their life right now. What you may not know is not just what they have been, but the grace of God that has been brought to bear in their lives and the transformation that's happening in front of you. I want CFC to be a place where there is a line drawn in the sand and truth is unapologetically spoken. I want us to call sin, sin, and I want us to speak of grace with power beyond us choosing or denying people's membership. But I want to tell you this, if I'm going to err on a side, I prefer to err on the side of grace being big enough, working in and through the problems and the obstacles and the difficulties in people's lives. If you wait around another minute or two, you're going to see Jesus do something extraordinary. And whoever is in the room trying to point out who earned the miracle or who should get the miracle, Jesus will silence them. You don't want to be one of those. Finally then, Jesus heals the man. The man goes out as a living testimony of God's kingdom come down. The man literally, as Jesus says, you're wondering if I have the authority and power to forgive the man's sins. Is it easier for me then just to say, get up and walk? And remember what Jesus said. He looks at the religious people. I believe, and he's looking at everybody in the room, but I believe he's looking at the religious folks and he's saying, do you need to see it? Let, 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 let me then send this man well and whole. So he looks back at the man, away from them, knowing that there's nowhere for them to go. Do you understand? A room that is filled so tight, there's no room to get in. It means there's no room to get out unless somebody at the door starts filtering out. Jesus has the religious spirit captivated and captured right there in order for him to look at this man and say, I now say to you, rise up and take your bed and go. And the man jumps up. The people are amazed. You remember I read to you a moment ago, Luke's account says that the people leave saying, we've never seen anything like this. Now, I've always read that to mean that the people who love Jesus and believe in Jesus and were there because they wanted to be and weren't picking and poking and trying to take control of the table were the ones that left amazed and excited. But the more I read the Gospel of Luke and imagine chapter 5 and that this particular moment, I wonder if it was that even those who had the religious spirit left amazed and overwhelmed by what they had just seen. Can I say this to you? That people will argue theology and doctrine till they are blue in the face, but when they see the power of God loosed in front of them, it is unmistakable and you've got to do something with it. Everybody, even the religious spirited people, by the way, brought to that moment for that very reason, even those people had to deal with what they had seen. 
what they'd heard about Jesus, they could argue the theology, but you cannot argue when a man who has been lowered down, paralytic and lame, suddenly stands up and carries his bed out. Signs and wonders shall follow those that believe. Father, I thank you this morning that in this place this morning, what I declare right now, I I believe with all of my heart, is the spirit that was loosed in this place a few moments ago. Because what I saw before I ever read this passage or what I saw before I ever declared these words were a group of people that were running to the battle and were grabbing four ropes and tying to the edge of people's cots and they were peeling back the ceiling and they were lowering friends and needs and circumstances and situations and the tears shed on this altar were the result of their determination to weep at times of weeping, but also knowing that times of rejoicing would come. And those four friends that lowered that man down are just like those who ran to the battle this morning and prayed and interceded and said yes to you and are trusting. God, we saw people get up. We saw people be free. Father, we leave this place today amazed. We leave this place today inspired and and, and excited To see, oh God, if you would do this in this moment and you would invite us to the table and let us be here to witness and see it, then what are the other things you will do if we continue to say yes? And so, Father, this morning, as a group, as a congregation, we are hungry to say yes. We are hungry, Lord, to see even more of those things that you are longing to do. And you've got to pick a house to do it. You could do it anywhere, but you picked the house that day in Capernaum. You picked the house and the place that you were going to bring the skeptics, but you were going to be the earnest seekers. You picked the place that day where the lame and the weary and the tired and the oppressed were going to wind up. It wasn't happenstance. Father, we just want to say to you today before we leave this place that we're happy you're picking CFC. It's not that you're excluding other places and and other things you're doing, God. It's just we love being part of the thing that you are up to in Cartersville. And even those that are watching and those things that are happening in other spaces and places, Lord, we love being a part of what you're up to. This is our commitment to you today, God, that as you give us grace and strength and help us, we will be adventurous and courageous and we will choose grace over finger pointing. We will choose mercy, Lord, which is the thing you desire. We'll be truth tellers and we will speak the truth in love. But oh God, we will always know that you had invited us and we don't deserve to be at the table. Therefore, whoever you invite, Lord, we're going to throw our arms wide. We're going to wrap them up in love and we're going to watch to see not only sin forgiven, but we're going to watch them get up and walk out of the place. Father, I thank you that you will do this in a place that your spirit is welcome. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome in this place. We leave today to be empowered and used outside the building. I thank you for what's going to happen in the house, but just like in Mark chapter 2, I thank you for everything that happened when that paralytic man who was now healed went outside and told his story. So we're leaving today. In a little while after our meeting, Lord, we're leaving today to tell our story. We're leaving today to share with others that which we have seen and been a part of. Father, we are amazed by what you do. We are amazed by what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good stuff on the way. The old words of the old, the best is yet to come. Listen, in just a moment, I'm not even going to say a prayer of dismissal. We're, we're going to see God take us outside the building. He's going to do some stuff inside the house, but the stuff outside the house, I can't wait to hear about. I, I, I want to invite you one more time, and I know they're gonna, I might even say a blessing before I send you across where you can go ahead and start eating when you get over there. We're going to be meeting just across the hall in the fellowship hall. The food is there and prepared. We plan for, I would say, easily the number of folks we have here. So please don't let, I feel, I feel bad eating the food, yada, yada, yada. Please don't let that be the reason you leave. I promise you that not only will you enjoy your sandwich and fellowship, 
but I, I promise you, you will enjoy hearing the things that are, that are being considered and talked about. And we want, we genuinely want your input. We want to hear what you feel and you sense going on. So I want to just invite you to stay and be a part of it. Don't miss. Hey, uh, if, if you knew the, the, uh, the comeback ending was happening at the end of the game, you wouldn't leave in the third quarter, would you? If you knew in the fourth quarter there was going to be a 63-yard field goal for your team to win the game, would you leave the stadium? I wouldn't. I'd sit till the last person trying to sweep the stands out ran me out of there. And I want to say the same thing to you. I promise you we're not going to run you out of here. I hope you'll stay and be a part of it. Father, as we fellowship today and as we seek to know your will and your direction and to be led by the wisdom that you said you would give freely, I pray that you would bless the food and the fellowship. I pray that, Lord, each and every person would get connected, and Lord, with the thing that you're up to in this house. And we are so thankful. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters all over the city that you are equally going to do mighty things in their midst. God, I thank you and pray for those pastors and leadership teams. And God, we just hold them up. We, we pray for those around the world that are naming your name and are your hands extended. God, we thank you and we are honored that you would choose our house to dwell in and to bring in those who need the miracle. Lord, we thank you that you will do that in our midst. Father, just bless the meeting and the time together. Guide our steps. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I, I did not, I'm assuming some folks headed that way to throw the ice in the coolers. Uh, let them know that we just said a blessing. I think I said, Lord, bless the food, didn't I? In the middle of all that, didn't we? Bless the food. Uh, as quickly as you can, I will say this, guys. The sooner we are over there and actually with our food in hand seated, we can start the meeting earlier. We do want to be mindful of your time. We don't want to keep you around all afternoon unnecessarily, but we, we do want you to be a part of it. So please head that way and let's eat and fellowship and